Hello, conspirators. A couple of quick things before we start this episode. Um, Kyle Moore is still on vacation, so our sound quality is not quite what we would like it to be, uh, but I fear that even his expertise couldn't have saved us on this one. Our guest, Robert McIntyre, was working in the background uh, in the lab that he works at throughout the episode, and you can hear the equipment, the sound quality on our end was mixed because of the way we had to set up the mics. Uh, I was in a different room on a different microphone and we're coming in all different volumes but it's all on one track and it was a nightmare to edit. Um, so please try and bear with us on this one because I think that even though we've had a lot of fun conversations on this podcast in the last couple of years, I think this is one of the most important, especially to anybody who is uh, sold on cryonics, some of Robert's work in this field is, I think, groundbreaking and will really change the, the terrain going forward. So it's really worth powering through some of the audio to try and get through this one. We are planning on having him back on in the near future for another episode. If anyone wants to send us questions to uh, submit to him for that episode, uh, you can do so at the subreddit, r slash the Bayesian Conspiracy. You can send us an email at BayesianConspiracyPodcast at gmail.com or comment on this episode on the website uh, at the Bayesian conspiracy. Anyway, try and uh, stick through and enjoy this episode. Thanks. Right. All right. It's a pleasure to talk to you guys. Yeah, you too. So, uh, pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to do this. We should start out with saying hello. This is the Basin Conspiracy. I'm Inyash Brodsky. I'm Stephen Zuber. And, on the and uh, my name is Robert McIntyre. Yes, hello. We have Robert McIntyre with us today. And Robert McIntyre is, uh, well, I, I met Robert at Burning Man when someone, I think it was you, wasn't it, brought up questions about bioethics, just, just sitting around in a, in a tent chatting with people? It was that lady who was, uh, it was, it was actually that lady who was um, studying, oh, what was it, uh, uh, feminism through the lens of I forget, but but she was studying like uh, plays from from the the eighteen hundreds. Oh, okay. Write your thesis on that. And somehow from that we got into bioethics, and then later on you came up to me and you started a conversation about cryonics, and I I had no idea who you were at the time. You were just like you know another cool guy at Burning Man. Uh, but you started out. I was thinking a good place to start this would be possibly the. The Dead Sea Scrolls uh, comparison that you brought up to me. Did you want to start? Oh with yeah. That? Sure. So, <clears throat> uh, the way I see brain preservation um, is that the goal is you want to preserve uh, the data that's contained in that brain, yeah. uh, so that you could then eventually extract that data. All right. And one uh, way to be thinking about this is in terms of data that's been preserved over thousands of years. Uh, to various natural circumstances. So, uh, you know, here's a good comparison between like Dead Sea Scrolls and those that existed in Pompeii. So, uh, when the when Pompeii got destroyed by this volcanic eruption, um, a bunch of ash came down and it just buried uh, the whole town, city type of place. So hot that there wasn't very much oxygen that it actually carbonized some of these scrolls. And so if you look at them, they are just, they look like they've been burnt to, to charcoal, basically. Black, incredibly fragile. Um, it seems kind of hopeless uh, that you could ever read anything from them. And they're still physically in the same about shape as they were uh, when they were buried. So and so like recently- up into the scroll rolls, right? Yeah, if you imagine, you know, if you were able to kind of kind of cook some scroll, you know, at a really high temperature so that it carbonizes, but it doesn't actually catch on fire and turn to ash. Um, it's, it's like charcoal scrolls. And so uh, Google, uh, in conjunction with this uh, university, actually, uh, x-ray through these scrolls and unroll them digitally, and you can read the text in them, which is very impressive. Um, on the other hand, if you have a hole in a manuscript, which they call a lacuna, um, it doesn't matter how advanced your imaging technology is, uh, you're almost certainly never going to be able to fill in that hole, right? Because the information is simply not there to be imaged at all. Is the, so, you know, the term lacuna, is that the term for the hole or for the scroll? A lacuna is a hole in a document. Okay. 
Oh shit. Hold on. I want to think about brain preservation. Uh, well, another another great comparison is the anti uh mechanism. So this was uh, one of the first computers, or at least an analog computer, that was built by the Greeks over 2,000 years ago. And uh, it had this, this crank on one side, and uh, you could spin this crank, and, and this network of over 40 gears would spin. Oh. And hey, Robert. Tell you when holidays were going to be in the future. Robert, oh, yeah? can I stop you for a second? I am having issues with my Wi Fi. I'm going to go downstairs and uh, get hooked up hardline. Okay, alrighty. In that case, we are back. Wonderful. So you had just told yep, us. Sounds that, good. Uh, a lucana is a whole in document? A lacuna. Lacuna, okay. That's your vocabulary word for the day, lacuna. It's a hole in a document that obscures the text. And so you're not going to be able to easily reconstruct that other than just by inferring it from the surrounding text, which the bigger the hole, the rap more rapidly you get into basically it being an impossible problem. Yeah. Um, so, you know, imagine you have a paragraph and then you just have a hole, and literally a physical hole in the middle of that paragraph. And um, you can I think, uh, what was it? You ever, you ever seen Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind? Yes, that was a great movie. Well, that company, I believe, was called Lacuna, right? Oh, shit, I have no idea. The I one that erased your memories. I didn't know what the word meant, so the name didn't stick out to me at all. Yeah, so that, I thought that was kind of cute, because they were going in and, and basically erasing memories, you know, putting holes in the story of your own life. Yeah. Uh, and they were called Lacuna <laughs> as a company. Nice. Good name. Um, and so, yeah, so to get back to this uh, Antikythera mechanism, uh, this was a geared instrument that was built by uh, Greek uh, mathematicians, astronomers, uh, over 2,000 years ago. And it had this uh, crank that you could spin and a system of gears, a uh, very beautiful object. And it would calculate when the next eclipse was or when the next holidays were going to be or where the planets were going to be. Um, as you turn this crank, you would, you know, kind of advance forward in time, and it would show you where these uh, celestial bodies are going to be. Um, and this was super advanced. It had what's called a differential gear, um, you know, kind of a gear with two sets of teeth on it that could, could uh, you know, adjust the gear ratios. And they wouldn't invent differential gears until, I believe, the 1400s or the 1600s. So wow. super ahead of its time. And then these Romans came and kind of took the Antikythera mechanism, and it was on this Roman ship. Um, and the ship hit this storm and uh, sank by the island of Antikythera, and all the treasures and things that were in that ship to the bottom of the ocean got covered up with mud and silt and salt and such. Uh, and they were lost until 1900 uh, when these sponge divers came, and they got hit by a similar sort of storm and knocked off course right on top of where the, the ship, uh, the Roman ship sank a long time ago. And they figured while they were there, they might as well go sponge diving, you know, so the, the trip wouldn't be a total loss. And uh, instead of sponges, they found, to this day, is still the greatest uh, buried or sunken treasure find ever. A um, bunch of neat statues, um, a lot of cool, you know, clay objects. And uh, they found this antiquitarian mechanism as well but it was this inscrutable hunk of mud encrusted gear types of things. And they knew it was really fancy and, and see some of the gears right on the, on the sides that were exposed, but they didn't dare try to take it apart because, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of a lost cause, right? Uh, they were worried they were going to break it. And so this is 1900, right? And it was unearthed in, in 1901. And it sat until 1980 or so, when they finally had uh, X-ray technology that could go and actually image through it without disrupting it physically. And then they were able to see the positions of the gears um, and, and figure out uh, how it was built and figure out you know, exactly how it was working. And now people make uh, versions of this kind of for fun. Uh, you can even download one on your phone and spin these virtual gears around, you know, a million times faster than, than it, you could ever spin the physical gear around. And it's going to do the same calculation that the original Antikythera machine did. So, you know, the, the ocean preserved the arrangement of the gears with enough detail that we were able to go and, and create that same system again.
and those original gears are never going to spin again. Uh, but those original gears guide uh, the way that other gears are going to be spinning. And you know, so that's a long way of saying that that I think you ought to emphasize uh, getting brains into a state where you could, um, in theory, uh, reconstruct them. But the actual functioning of uh, the individual neurons, you know, like whether they can metabolize sugar, for example, is it nearly as important as the data that's been encoded in those neurons? And, um, and the reason you you brought this up and you were speaking to me about it was because you said that uh, you are not signed up for cryonics right now. Is that correct? Well, I am currently signed up for cryonics right now, actually. Oh, you are? I thought you uh, you were not. No, no, I am. Okay. Um, it's it's the type of thing I think is a very low, very very low chance of succeeding given given what I know now, and so that motivates me to try and make something that'll work better. Um, so that's that's kind of what I'm working on right now. Yes, like I mean, so I've got a quick question to uh, uh, Enosh points out that you're working in that literally as we're speaking because you're setting up that. Uh, yeah, I I, I mix some chemicals as we're as we're currently speaking uh, to do some do some experiments. That's today. awesome. Um, so I had a quick clarification question. Well, not clarification, I guess, just dive in. You said that the that preserving the um, the data that's stored on the brain is more important than, than preserving, I guess, absolutely everything. You know, you gave the example of, of uh, uh, what was that word for? Lacuna? Holes in, yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, Lacuna, um, yep. So the, I guess my question is that, uh, what's the way to put this? What format is the information in the brain stored in that is relevant here? Well, it's thought that information stored in the brain by physical remodeling of synapses. And so a synapse is a connection uh, between one neuron and another neuron. Um, and it's almost like, you know, if you take your, put your arm out and uh, you guys can record video, right? Uh, not for the podcast. Not for the podcast. All right. So, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you stuck your arm out in front of you and then you just grabbed onto your elbow, right, you're going to see how you have this long arm, right, and you have a hand kind of grabbing onto it, and those are kind of like what synapses look. They look like, you know, one thing reaching out and, and locking onto another longer thing. Um, sen a neuron will send out something called a dendritic arbor, um, which, you know, it makes a bunch of, uh, it looks like a huge tree with a bunch of branches going everywhere. Everywhere along that tree, other neurons might be able to reach out, connect to that, and make a synapse, right? And you know, all of those neurons are going to be talking to that one neuron the, with the dendritic tree and, uh, you know, influencing it to fire more or fire less um, in proportion to how intensely they're connected to the tree. And the neuron's job is it kind of integrates all that information together and then it decides whether it wants to fire uh, an action potential or not. And then that neuron itself is connected with a lot of other neurons that reach out and touches their trees. And so the brain is this huge network of of neurons that are talking to each other through synapses. Um, and when you encode a memory, you see that your synapses change in size. And the bigger a synapse is, uh, the more powerful a connection it, it's making and the more strongly it'll influence the behavior of that neuron. Um, so for example, there's some really cool experiments where uh, you can literally watch a motor memory being encoded in motor cortex in a mouse. As that mouse learns a new task, um, you can label just exactly the synapses that are expanded in size during this uh, learning experience. Um, and then you can cause those synapses to, to shrink back to their original size um, with some very clever, um, basically, uh, optogenetic uh, techniques. And when those, just those synapses are, are shrunken, it erases that motor memory. So um, it's not like we know everything about how memories work in the brain. But we we know more than is is generally appreciated, I think. And yes. the, you got this deal called you know the synaptic theory of memory, which is is sort of the current dogma of neuroscience. It says that you know to a first approximation, synapses are encoding memory. So so to answer your question of what does it look like, um, you know if you could preserve the physical structure of these synapses so that you can say for each neuron, you know what other neurons is it connected to, and how strongly is it connected to those neurons. Um, it seems that that is definitely essential for uh, preserving memories, um, and there's still debate over whether that's sufficient for preserving memories. So that, that's exactly what I was that yeah. into. Well, but if you're not preserving the synapses, then it would be unlikely that you're preserving memories. Maybe yeah. there's some redundant system, or maybe there's some way to infer it, but like those lacunas, right? Um, if there's very tiny holes in a document, you probably won't have too much trouble inferring text. As you make those holes bigger, 
um, and the obscure are just one or two characters, you still might be able to totally recover the text. As you make them bigger and they get rid of a whole word, then depending on the text, you may still be able to recover it. But then as they start getting rid of multiple words or whole sentences or just a half of a paragraph somewhere, uh, your problem quickly grows into something that's basically impossible to really get the words back. And right. you had up to me uh, recent uh, uh, preservations at Alcor, and you have made the lacuna comparison to, to point out the problems with how they, the, the preservation was happening. Can you, can you go into a few of the recent preservations for me and why you were worried about what you'd read? Well, okay, so um, let's say, I'll, I'll, let's bring up the last thing that Alcor did. Because um, they keep a log of their preservations. And um, if you look at the last uh, several preservations, uh, like if you take a look at the last six or so, you're going to find there's quite a bit of time uh, between death and even when the preservation has started. Um, so, you know, let, let's, actually, let's actually bring one up. Can you, can you take a look? Oh. Uh, you have that? Sure. Hold on a second. You know where they are, right? Uh, I do not, actually. I'm assuming at Alcor site, but I don't know more than that. Yeah, let's go. Let's see. Let's see what we got here. Um, here we go. Alcor.org slash cases. Yep. All right, so let's just pick up the last one. Was that? I had a quick thing to dive into while I pulled that up so I can follow along. So right around where we covered with the uh, encoding of memories um, is about all, that, all of that stuff is about the limit of my understanding of that sort of thing. And the question I wanted to ask really quick was, in your opinion, or is this known whether or not the, um, so like you said, uh, synapses fire when the action potential threshold is reached, um, is there any importance to say this synapse is 60% towards its threshold for action potential? Uh, and if so, well, is that information storable? Yeah, they call that um, sub-threshold signaling, and it's it's definitely a thing neurons do, and it's definitely, you know, useful. Some, there's, like, neurons in many cases work very digitally. You know, it's either an all-or-nothing type of deal. Of course, in the dendritic arbor itself, right, as that neuron's trying to figure out whether to fire or not, those sub-threshold potentials are kind of battling it out, and the geometry of that uh, dendritic arbor may matter very critically for what the ultimate uh, signal is going to be in the neuron's cell body, um, so that, you know, what it's going to decide. And even the lengths of the, of the different trees, you know, if, if it takes a signal a little bit longer to reach um, one part of the arbor than it takes another, you know, those can have interesting effects. We can set up some interesting, you know, timing around that. Um, there's a lot of very interesting review papers on dendritic computation, uh, which, you know, we can uh, send out to, to your, your listeners um, if they want to look at it in more detail. On the other hand, there's also been some recent really good work in simulating uh, neurons, um, and they, they asked this exact question, you know, how specific do you need to get to still get reasonable behavior um, that approximates what, what the neurons actually do in life? Um, and they found that, at least for the system they were studying, you didn't need to do very much more than a very crude approximation of the dendritic arbor, if that. So it probably matters, yes. And uh, most of what you get that is the geometry of the tree, right? So if you're preserving the structure of everything, um, including the dendritic trees, including the synapse, um, including even some uh, proteins that are contained in that synapse, uh, in the, the ion channels and the receptor proteins that, that exist at synapse, um, the more you can preserve, uh, the better. And the less structural distortion you can cause in the brain, the better. Um, so, you know, uh, let, let's, let's pull up the last one. So we, uh, you're seeing this uh, A1649, Robert Whitaker, right? 3rd of June, 2017. All right, so this is this is the most recent one. Well, he skims that. I wanted to thank you for that dive in. That's, uh, that's exactly what I was looking to hear. And if you have anything relevant to send along to us to put on the website, that'd be really cool. Yeah, there's some really cool papers. This is you two. Uh, one's a review paper about dendritic computation. That's a really good read. And one of them is just a recent attempt to stimulate neurons where, you know, they try different types of simulations that go into more complex approximations of the dendritic arbor and find there's not much of an effect for those neurons that they're simulating. Awesome. All right, thanks. Sorry for the, dis the uh, disjointed conversation here. Let's dive into Robert Whitaker's case. All right, so, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just summarize this for you, but you guys are reading it too, so, uh, you know, feel free to point out anything you feel is necessary. But uh, let's see. So we have Saturday, June 3rd. Robert was found deceased at home, and Alcor gets notified by the personal assistant who'd gone out shopping. And so, you know, this is a situation where this person had already been dead for some amount of time beforehand. 
and then someone discovers them. And uh, then they call Alcor, and the people from Alcor come in at 9.30 Arizona time. I'm not sure exactly what... Oh, okay, they're always, using, um, they're always using military time here. Okay, so June 3rd, 16.25, they find that this person has died, okay? And then 9.30 Arizona time, Sunday morning. So uh, we're talking about the next day, June 4th, on Sunday, right? So uh, 16.25 to 9.30, all right? So, you know, that's that's about 16.30 to 9.30. So how many hours is that? Uh, from 4 to 9, that's 12, and another 5, so 17 hours. All right, so that's 17 hours before anything even starts, okay? He's lying there presumably at room temperature. They claim surgery went well, perfusion went better than expected, good flow is established, and they finished attempting to do this cryo preservation at 12.50 Arizona time, so another four hours or so. Uh, or sorry, another three hours and, and 20 minutes. Um, and then they uh, put this person in a dry ice um, and sent him over, and uh, they're going to cool him down. So the key takeaway here is uh, you got 17 hours of what we call normothermic ischemia. Uh, so there's another one of your words of the day is ischemia, uh, meaning lack of adequate blood flow to maintain life in a, in a tissue. And, and, in, and in layman's terms, that's real bad news for crowd preservation, as my is my understanding. Well, you know, what I would like to see is a clear study of how brains degrade over time um, in the situations that, that Alcor uh, normally expects. And then that should be the answer to, you know, what do we think about whether information is being preserved or not, right? So, you know, the what I'd like to be seeing is arguing about this from a synaptic point of view, saying, are synapses preserved? How well can they be traced back to whatever neuron they're coming from? Um, those types of questions. Does that make sense? Yes, that's awesome. And then we should judge whether a preservation procedure is, you know, good or not based on how well it's preserving the synapses. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, not much is known about how human connectomes degrade over time uh, after death. Uh, connectome is another good word. This is the set of all your synapses. So you've got your genome, and that's kind of how you build someone's body. And then a connectome is kind of how you build someone's memories and mind and personality. And, and so, you know, it's a, a technique that preserves the connectome is almost certainly going to be better than a technique that doesn't preserve the connectome. Right. With a couple of, of caveats there, all right? A lot of the biopreservation protocols, you know, that are currently used for cryonics are based around the discipline of cryobiology, right? And so this is, you know, the science of, of applying cold to biology and seeing how that breaks it or how you can preserve it with cold, right? Um, encompasses a lot of things, including how you destroy tissue with cold and also how you might preserve tissue, right? And one of the crowning achievements of cryopreservation would be the ability to preserve an organ so that you could transplant it, right? Uh, and, you know, ideally you'd even be able to store organs for years and then warm them back up and transplant them, right? And so, you know, the field of cryobiology is very interested in maintaining life of the cells, right? Maintaining their metabolic capacity, maintaining their ability to uh, be successfully used in a transplantation scenario, right? Um, but I would argue that that's not quite the thing we want when it comes to preserving brains, right? For a heart, of course, you know, a heart is only good for pumping blood. So if it's not capable of pumping blood, uh, there, there's really nothing good you can get out of it. Right? So if your preservation technique doesn't make it still be able to pump, it's no good. Right? But a brain is there for doing computations and storing data. Right? And so you, know, you might very well say, I don't care if the brain can still function, if, if these, these neurons in particular can still fire, or if it can still metabolize sugar, or you know, do the typical things that, that are required to be alive. What I care about is, is the data still there. Right? Um, and so that would be, you know, more looking at this from the perspective of computer science and neuroscience, and even, you know, in some ways, kind of like library science, right? We're trying, to, we're trying to preserve information. And it gives you some new opportunities, right? If you're willing to sacrifice the metabolic capacity of your, of your brain for better information preservation, uh, that might be a really good trade to be making. Definitely. Um, for the brain in particular. But you're not going to necessarily want to be doing that if your your founding discipline is, is cryobiology, right? Because that's totally antithetical to cryobiological techniques, right? You don't want to 
you know, totally destroy the metabolic capacity of a heart and say, hey, but the structure of the heart, you know, those muscle fibers still look exactly like they did when the heart was alive, right? That's only going to be good for anatomical studies, right? So the, uh, the field... And, and so those are, those are the things... So the, the research that's going on in that field is kind of not useful for what we want with the brain because they're trying to preserve the function rather than the structure. Well, you know, if you perfectly preserve the function and perfectly preserve the structure, that's even better, right? If you could achieve what they call um, uh, suspended animation, right, where you could actually shut down an organism and bring it back and have it walk off the table, uh, clearly you could prove that that preserves memory by just doing standard memory assays like they do for animals or just if it's a person, just ask them and uh, interview them for a while, right? Yeah. Um, but in lieu of that, the question is, what are the empirical tests you want to do to determine whether a preservation protocol works or not, or whether it's better than another preservation protocol, right? And I think in lieu of total and complete perfect revival, um, you know, of course, you can choose different surrogates that you're going to use for these protocols. But I think the one that, that maybe you ought to be choosing is the ones that are informed by neuroscience telling us how our memories encode. And so I think a really good first step is connectome preservation. Can you preserve all the synaptic connections such that they're still traceable? Um, that was what the Brain Preservation Prize was all about. It, it laid down this challenge that said, uh, how do we preserve brains so that we know the connectome is still there? Um, or can we preserve brains so that we know the connectome is still there? And, uh, and um, you bring yeah. up the Brain Preservation Prize, uh, we have not mentioned this yet in the podcast, and I am very remiss not having said that, but you actually recently won the Small Mammal Brain Preservation Prize, yes? That is right. We won that, uh, well, like February 13th last year, um, or this year, I guess. And uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a lot of fun. And uh, we're still fighting for the Large Mammal Brain Preservation Prize, and and, and hopefully we'll, we'll know more about that very shortly. Um, so what, what exactly is the Small Mammal Brain Preservation Prize, and how did you go about winning that? Small Mammal Brain Preservation Prize um, is the scientific prize, kind of like, you know, the X Prize, um, that was, was put together by this nonprofit called the Brain Preservation Foundation. And they're really interested in, in looking at this from a more neuroscience perspective and saying, uh, we want to be able to preserve brains. Um, Memories are there, and the first step is preserving the connectome. So let's make a prize for that because it seemed achievable. And the prize is very simple. Um, you can do whatever you want to these brains uh, to preserve them. And the criteria is you've got to be able to make a very good case that your preservation technique will, will keep the brain stable for at least 100 years. And number two is you're going to submit brains you've done this to to the Brain Preservation Foundation and then they're going to independently evaluate uh, the quality of the preservation with electron microscopy. They're just going to look at the synapses, and they're going to evaluate them the same way that they would evaluate their own uh, attempts at studying the brain, um, because it's generally understood what good brain preservation looks like, you know, good synaptic connectivity, and what damaged synaptic connectivity looks like. And so that's independently evaluated. Hello? Uh-oh. I think we lost So, um, <laughs> Uh, a guy named Janelle, and he's named uh, Sebastian Sanzenation. He's a neuroscientist at Princeton who's really popularized the word connectomics. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. Can you, can you back up about 30 seconds? You dropped out mm -hmm. for a little bit. Yeah, sure. So, so the deal is, look, you got to preserve a brain. Um, you need to make a really good argument that it'll keep that brain preserved for at least 100 years. you got to send it to the Brain Preservation Foundation, and they're going to look at, at the synapses and see if they're well-preserved. Now, um, what, and that basically means for every synapse, you can trace it back to a neuron. What kind of surprised me is that I had sort of assumed that they something like this had been done before. Where they froze, you know, small test brains and then looked at them and saw that they were decently preserved. Was that not the case? Well, for over 50 years, we've known how to uh, temporarily preserve brains by perfusing them with uh, aldehyde fixatives. And we've known how to image brains very well, um, but only a slice of the brain, okay? okay? And so the problem is if you just preserve a brain with aldehydes, it'll eventually degrade over time. It's hard to make a case that that would last for at least 100 years uh, because although the brain's been very well preserved, um, it's still aqueous. It's still in an environment with water, and the random thermal motion of that water is going to uh, cause degradation over time especially with the lipids, um, you know, brains mostly lipids and proteins, and aldehydes like aldehyde or formaldehyde uh, do a good job locking down proteins and don't do as good a job locking down lipids. And so you'll find in very old chemically preserved brains 
that uh, you get this kind of lipid film develop at the top of the uh, vessel that the brain is in. And this is caused by migration of lipids over, over many years, just due to the thermal action of water. And the freezing the brain didn't help us uh, stop that? Well, you can't just freeze a brain that's been preserved with um, which is aldehydes because you'll get the ice crystals. And although you'll you know stop this thermal motion of water, the ice crystals are going to tear up all your synapses and uh, just cause a lot of, of major mayhem everywhere. And to prevent that, they perfused the brains with some sort of cryoprotectant solution, right? Or did that down? Yeah. So the the technique I came up with is called aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation, and it's combining kind of the best of both worlds from the chemical fixation and from the cryopreservation. You start with aldehydes lock everything down, and then you can take your time adding cryoprotectant slowly so that you don't distort anything. Um, and then you can vitrify that brain by cooling it down, and it'll be solid, and uh, you can then warm it up and demonstrate that, that the synaptic connectivity is preserved. And that is that is what you did? Yep, that's right. That is fucking fantastic. Now, why hadn't they been doing that before? Because I, I had always heard that they did use cryoprotectants like Alcor and CI and such. Well, they use cryoprotectants, but they don't use fixatives at the beginning. Okay. Um, and so you, you can't demonstrate that you can preserve synapses with the current uh, cryoprotectants only, right? So, you need the fixatives to stabilize everything first. So what they do right now is just put in cryoprotectants and freeze it, and your your contention is that that does not really fix things in place and preserve them the way they should be preserved. Well, it's never been demonstrated that, that it preserves synapses, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, what I would like to see is in an animal model you know, do things similar to what happens to humans. So, you know, let them sit for 17 hours, then do your preservation and slice that brain up and, and look at it with electron microscopy and see how good it looks. Um, no one has done that yet? And, and not really. I mean, oh. um, I have where... always assumed that someone had just taken animal brain and put cryoprotectants in it and frozen it and then unfrozen it and looked at it. Well, Sometimes that, that is done, sometimes it's looked at, but it's never been demonstrated to preserve synapses, right? Oh, I, I did um, not realize. Yeah, that's but there also hasn't been very much, much work done in that yet. Before I get preserved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's not very much stuff that's been that's been done, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of the things that are done are done on, you know, animals, zero minutes ischemic time, right? Um, but even those, the, the problem is... Uh, without the fixatives, your brain is kind of degrading over time, right? And so you don't have unlimited time to get this cryoprotectant in, right? Um, and you've got to be way more careful about what cryoprotectants you're using um, because, you know, the brain is much less stable, right? So what happens practically is these brains end up getting dehydrated, and then when you try to image them, uh, the resulting electron micrographs are uninterpretable. We can't really make out synapses. We can't make out structures. Um, it doesn't look very traceable. And so the contention currently is that, you know, maybe it is traceable anyway if you could somehow expand it or with some other technology you could see that they're there. But um, in terms of, of a neuroscientist like Ken Hayworth being able to look at it and say, yeah, this is traceable, like this ought to retain the structures and improve memory, um, that can't currently be done um, with traditional cryoprotective techniques, uh, such as are used by Alcor. Yeah. So the people that have been uh, preserved recently, maybe in the far future, once we have really advanced technology, we can decode what's been what's been done due to the prior, uh, prior cryoprotective perfusion. But it's going to be it's going to be hard, and you are trying to make that process less hard and more stable. You know, I don't think humanity is ever going to be able to fix some of these lacunas in ancient documents. I just don't see how you do it. It's gone. The information is destroyed. And no matter how sophisticated you can image the remaining pages, right, you're not going to get past a hole. And so the question is, you know, when we preserve brains now, is it more like rendering them inscrutable but still fundamentally uh, with their information intact, or is it more, you know, like the burned up uh, uh, carbonized scrolls in, from Pompeii, or is it more like the lacunas in these scrolls where you're never going to be able to infer anything? Um, and that gets into a lot of I subtle think, things and, some of the stuff I've read. and such, but yeah. Sorry, what were you saying, Stephen? I was going to say, some of the things that I've read, people contend that even if the lacuna is my new word of the day, like you said, but, uh, even if they, they lose, say, 30% of their memories or something, 
if they have to relearn, you know, relearn how to hold a spoon or whatever it is, that, you know, some fidelity going into the future is still better than nothing. Um, uh, sure, yeah. You know, but but, the, less, uh, the less you lose, the better. Certainly, I want to keep as much as possible. Yeah, and I think you, know, you can get into a situation where you might not be able to get hardly anything back. It really depends on, on a lot of more subtle factors, but without getting too into the details, um, I guess, you know, my thoughts are why not get something that you know preserves the connectome and kind of work from there, you know? My thoughts exactly as well. <laughs> I completely agree. I'm not defending the old practice. I just, I'm saying that I think this was a known issue that people just sort of bit the bullet on. Um, well, yeah, yeah I mean, there's I'm, nothing to do. I'm but, I mean, told, let's do it as well as possible. Yeah, I think there, there can sometimes be some complacency there. It's like, you know, if you think that anything is possible in the future, um, then it sort of doesn't matter. But in that case, why even bother getting preserved, right? Like, yeah. if you really believe that the future can, can fix these holes, right, then just cremate yourself and they'll figure out how to, you know, look, <laughs> and, look at the universe. Like in, the, like in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, they said, oh, just looking at this one pie or something, you can see the whole universe in it, everything that's ever happened and all that good stuff. Uh, but, you know, if you want to come back within this century using modifications from technology we currently have, but faster, you know, like an electron microscope, but a million times faster, um, the path to do that is, you know, preserve the connectome. So how did you get involved? Because apparently you found out that things were not sufficient and you started working on this. What, what brought that about? I mean, it's not like it's hard to find out. I mean, Alcor is super above board on what they can do and what they can't do. Alcor doesn't claim that they preserve the connectome. They claim, you know, based on cryobiology, we're going to try to apply the best cryobiological technique similar to an organ preservation technique that we can and hope for the best. That's their, that's their case, right? Were you already yeah. in some sort of a biological program? Uh, well, you know, I've always wanted to understand how the brain works and digitize memories, right? Like, since I can remember, that's what I wanted to do. And it seemed like it would be a very difficult problem, so that's why I went to MIT. And originally I was going to be studying, you know, current ways that they use to scan brains and, and understand how brains work and try to make them scale up so you could apply it to a person and kind of extract their memories and digitize them while they were alive. That was what I was imagining, right? That you'd, you'd put something into their brain, you'd use some advanced imaging technology and, and do it that way. And uh, I quickly realized after looking at, you know, what existed at the time, that that was really hard. And, you know, although we probably can put something like that together, it's going to be an awful long time before that's really practical, right? Um, but studying neuroscience and studying computer science, I realized, you know, A, uh, you know, if you've ever emulated a system before, uh, you know that a, a good enough approximation of a computational system basically is that computational system, right? A calculator, uh, you can use that to add numbers, you can use it to do your, cal your taxes, right? Yeah. And then imagine a simulation of that calculator, like in a video game, right? Mm -hmm. um, you might just superficially simulate it, right, where it's just a thing that has buttons or something. But if you really got into the details and simulated it at the transistor level, right, the individual little circuits in that calculator, and suddenly it's not just a really a simulation of a calculator, it is a calculator in its own right, uh, because you can still do your taxes on it, right? Um, you press the buttons, it adds the numbers. That's what a calculator does. And, um, you know, between neuroscience and computer science, I think it's very clear that the brain is a computational device. And so the brain can be emulated, the brain can be copied the same way that other computational devices can be copied. Um, it just may be very difficult to do so. Um, and then the other thing you learn from neuroscience is that the brain clearly is, a, is, is more of a static structure than people people think it is. Um, because you can pull someone down in ultra profound hypothermia, or because, you know, there are many situations you can, can cause to happen where there's no electrical activity anymore, right? You know that there is some, some static structure that's sufficient to capture all of your memories. And that was very exciting because that means you don't have to scan someone while they're alive. The minimum thing you need to do is figure out how to preserve someone, right? So, you know, originally I wanted to uh, figure out how to digitize brains. I saw that, that the technologies for doing that in an active way are really, really fiendishly difficult. I went into AI actually to hope to, you know, build something that could figure out how to do uploading, right? Um, because it seemed like such a hard problem that maybe you need to step back and work on building better tools. But then after figuring out a little bit more about, you know, what you could viably do as a minimum sort of 
product for brain uh, banking, um, and that you could actually preserve a brain instead of having to scan the whole thing in and digitize it. Um, I thought, you know, maybe that is tractable. Maybe you can, can use some of the tricks that people have come up with over the last 50 years and actually make a brain banking technique that could preserve the information and prove that you could preserve the information. And that seemed just about tractable, and I felt like I could maybe do it. And uh, there was this prize, and I really wanted to win the prize, so uh, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you make it sense You're like, oh, here's a prize. Let's go and try to win it. But, you know, my dad and I were... Uh, I went on this walk and was like, son, what would you do if you weren't doing AI, right? Mm -hmm. I thought about it then. I was like, well, I'd figure out how to bank brains, you know, because that'd be also a pretty valid thing to do. Yeah. And uh, we actually, that night, I was like, actually, that's kind of kind of a neat idea. Let's explore that a bit. So we went and read a bunch of cryobiology literature, and we weren't really very impressed uh, because, like, 1950s, you know, this guy named Polge uh, figured out how to preserve sperm with glycerol, and... If you look at the current cryobiology papers, a lot of them are still talking about preserving sperm to the nth degree. So there's not been too much progress over the last 50 years or so. And so, you know, we were a bit skeptical. But then when I saw the Brain Preservation Foundation, right, and they were talking about just preserving, you know, synaptic connectivity and evaluating it rigorously with electron microscopy, I thought, well, you know, cryobiology is maybe not the right way to be thinking about this. Um, it's sort of... They're trying to preserve brains and they're trying to preserve metabolism. And it's really the preserving metabolism part that is, is the difficult part. So there are actually two competitors for this brain preservation prize, which I you know, started volunteering for. And one of them was, uh, was 21st century medicine, and they were doing the cryobiology approach, right? So their goal was to preserve the brain and preserve the metabolism, right? And they were running into a lot of difficulties because that is a very hard thing to do. And there was another team in Germany that was trying to prepare a brain for electron microscopy, right? And so, of course, in the process of, of doing that, you would have had to have preserved the brain in sufficient quality to win the brain preservation prize. And so they were trying to preserve brains and stain them with heavy metals and turn them into plastic so that you could put them in an electron microscope. And so they were still not really doing just the core of, of the problem, right? And I was like, I'm just going to put both of those things together, right? Because the hard part from uh, the Makula's technique was not the initial preservation. It was the staining and plastic embedding that's necessary for electron microscopy. And the hard part from cryobiology and the weakness was, um, you know, you can't store a brain that's been just preserved with aldehydes for 100 years. And cryobiology had the, the total opposite. Um, they had a really good answer to long-term storage, which was vitrification but they struggled at the early stages of the preservation process to efficiently lock down biomolecules, right? And so yeah, I used the short game of the, of the German guys, uh, Makula, and the longer-term game from the cryology guys and are put you, them together. Are, is, is it, is, are you and your team the, literally the only people working on this in terms of just preserving the brain right now? You know, uh, in some ways, every neuroscience lab in the world touches on brain preservation to some degree or another, um, because if you want to study the brain, you got to do something about uh, locking structures down. But as far as I know, we're the only group that's focused on whole brain preservation with the explicit goal of, of developing memory preservation. So first of all, that is terrifying. I thought there were more people working on it. But <laughs> second of all, thank you so much for doing this, the, the good work of this. This is just I, I I do not know how to express my gratitude enough. I second that oh. sentiment. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's uh, I think it's pretty it's a pretty wild you know ride, and I really hope I can get something that that's a good solution. And you know, basically, the deal is um, we can preserve whole connectomes, right? And the question is, is preserving a whole connectome sufficient to preserve memories? And neuroscience gives a tentative yes right now, but uh, anything you can do to make that uh, less tentative is going to be very useful. So, uh, you know, over the next uh, couple of years, uh, you know, we're kind of gearing up to focus on how do you do memory preservation, right? And, uh, you know, I think that that's doable um, because, you know, I proved that I could preserve all of the synapses in a brain, but I didn't have to scan all the synapses to do that. What I did was I just said, look anywhere you want, and if there's even one synapse that's disrupted, I lose, okay? And Hayworth looked in 10 different places and decided it was good. Um, and so, you know, I think you can do a similar trick for proving that you can preserve all of the memories. It's not so much about totally reconstructing a brain, 
right, which is economically infeasible and really difficult. It's more like constructing weird experiments that look sort of like zero knowledge proofs where, you know, you wouldn't be able to sort a group of 10 brains into two different groups without accessing some type of information that's correlated with a memory, right? Or, you know, arguing about here's like a transfer function of how, you know, a set of neurons work, and here's, you know, us approximating that transfer function uh, with sufficient detail to replicate the behavior, right, um, after scanning it in. Like, those types of things, and I'm actually working right now with, with several neuroscientists to try and put together, you know, what those experiments look like. It's, it's something we've been thinking about uh, very carefully over the last uh, two years. But I think that is tractable. I do think, and, and there's already very interesting results. Like, it's already in the literature that you could optogenetically, so, so here, here's the experiment, all right, and this exists in the literature if you put together a few papers, um, although it would be useful to, to do it explicitly, um, but here you go, all right, you have 10 mice, all right, and uh, in each of the 10 mice, you're going to label two engrams, okay, that kind of represent a place number, all right, and one of them's red and one of them's green, so, you know, uh, you got the kitchen, and that's green. You got the living room, and that's going to be red, right? And then in five of those mice, uh, you create a fear memory of the kitchen, and the other five, you make the fear memory of the living room, okay? And so it's just a single memory, and that's the main core thing that separates the two groups of mice, all right? And then you preserve all their brains with your uh, brain preservation technique, and then you can do anything you want, uh, after you've done the preservation, but the goal is to sort the 10 brains into two groups, okay? And if those two groups then correspond to the two original training groups, then that's proving that you've preserved one bit of memory, one high-level bit associated with, you know, were they afraid of this place or this other place? Um, and if you can't sort them, then that technique's worse than a technique that can sort them, right? Yeah. You can always argue, maybe if you had better analysis, you, you could sort them after all, but I like these types of approaches because they're creating kind of a new empirical system for evaluating preservation protocols. And that's, that's a new science that I think we ought to have is, you know, being able to evaluate memory preservation, brain banking techniques uh, really rigorously like this. And that is the next thing that you're going to be working on or that you are working on? Yeah, well, I'm working on it right now, yeah. So uh, let me let me uh, back up just a little bit. You won the small mammal brain preservation prize. Are you working on the large mammal one too? Is there is there difficulty scaling it up to a larger animal? Uh, no. So to give you an idea, um, I mean the whole point of this is I want to scale it up to humans. Yeah. And I wouldn't have designed it in a way that wouldn't scale easily because to me there's not very much of a point. And so the the key deal here is you're doing perfusion, right? So you're going through the vasculature of the animal and um, no matter how big that animal is, the, the circulatory system is already designed to deliver blood, oxygen, and sugar to every single cell, right? So if you can co-opt that system for your own use um, and use it well, you're going to get to every cell. Uh, to give you an idea of the scalability of this, it took me about seven months or so uh, to make this work for a rabbit brain, okay? okay. Um, and a lot of that was chemical development. And uh, guess how long it took me to modify it and uh, build the machines, design them, and uh, get it ready to work for a pig brain. Uh, three more months. <laughs> it took me six five, weeks. six weeks. It took me five hours oh, in one day. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it worked. Awesome. Um, so that was designing the... the machine and building it and 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 preparing the chemicals for it. Uh, so you got the large mammal prize pretty much on lock. You th you think now? Well, so uh, we submitted for the prize, mm -hmm. and um, I have independently evaluated some electron micrographs from those pig brains myself. And to me, they look pretty good. Um, I think it's it's definitely a, a contender. Uh, they're being evaluated right now, so um, we ought to hear more from that pretty soon. But I would I would give it a you know higher than seventy percent chance that we're going to win that prize. Now I'm I'm really curious about this since the since the fixing the brain first with the uh, amaldehydes was it amaldehydes? Um, it's a it's a glutaraldehyde which is uh, part of this chemical class of, of aldehydes that okay. include formaldehyde, acrolin, melandehyde, all that, all that good stuff. Okay, so since fixing the brain first with an aldehyde and then taking as long as you need to to put in cryoprotectants and then freezing it slowly, it seems like such a superior technique. Are Alcor and CI adopting this technique in their preservations? Well, uh, no, but there's good reasons why they wouldn't want to. Um, and, and the main reasons come from A... 
it's a very demanding technique. If you're going to fix something with aldehydes, you really almost would need to be there right as the animal dies, right? Okay. And preferably, you actually um, euthanize the animal as part of the preservation process. Um, in it's states, much less forgiving. In, in some states, that's legal, and I totally am hoping to die in one of those states, <laughs> if, mm-hmm. if possible. But, but uh, you know, Alcor... Um, for better or worse, you know, if you look at their recent preservations, right, uh, they wouldn't be very equipped to, to actually do this for individuals because there's generally a lot of time after death before they start any preservation procedure, right? So an initial flush of cryoprotectants will, to some degree, open up the vasculature. An initial flush of glutaraldehyde is not going to do that for you. And then the other part is this almost philosophical debate, uh, which is... You know, a lot of people don't like the idea of uploading um, or don't like the idea of sacrificing this metabolic ability. If you care very much about preserving the actual, like, cells that make up your brain, then it's almost a non-starter to glue them all together, right? Um, Because the most realistic way you're going to get someone back from a procedure like this is an advanced imaging technology that's going to create a digital simulacrum of that brain. While the original brain, like the original antikythera mechanism, is permanently fused into the solid mass that is never going to work again. Right. And, you know, there's some debate over that because, I mean, like, I would still argue that if you're, you know, got some kind of crazy Drexlerian nanotechnology or whatever, that it'd probably be easier to cut cross links than to infer structure. But in any case... Well, and do they even need their original brain back? With advanced enough technology, couldn't they just regrow, if, they, if they're if they wedded to an organic meat body, couldn't they just regrow a brain and structure the neurons so that they are mapping to the the preserved solid glued chunk of brain that you have as your brain? Well, yeah, but some people some people believe that that wouldn't be them. Huh. If they are caught, they'd just be a copy, you know? Is oh. the common uh, common deal, right? So they want it's kind of like you know, if you were writing your term paper, you know, mm-hmm. and then suddenly your computer dies, all right, and now you don't have your term paper anymore, and you know the sense of dread comes because you really needed this, and you know you don't have enough time. It's it's due really soon. Uh, it's due the next morning, right? Mm-hmm. If someone then came and said, "Oh, hey, actually, uh, there's a backup of this in the cloud," okay, yeah, uh, and presses some keys, and now suddenly you have your term paper again. You know, some people might feel like now their term paper is back. Some people may start crying and say, but it's not the same term paper. It's not the same bits that it was, you know? Mm-hmm. And so some people feel that way about their, their brains as well. So because it's of, not the same one. So because of those people, Alcor is not, not implementing this thing. Well, I wouldn't say that, but I mean, uh, if someone signed up for something that they, that they thought was one way and then they changed to another way, that might be... You know, problem. Oh, I see. So we, ugh, so we almost have to petition them to start another track of services where they will uh, fix the brain. I mean, not right now, obviously, but after there has been more development down this track. Well, you know, people like Hayworth have said that they don't think Alcor should be preserving anybody um, because if you don't have a technique that you know preserves synapses, for him it's like a non-starter, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, Hayworth would probably argue that. Um, until such time as you can show that you're preserving synapses, right? Um, there's almost no point to even doing a technique at all. You know, but that's tricky because that competes with this idea of, well, let's do the best we can, right? And, and hope that the future will be able to fix whatever we did wrong. And then, then you've got this problem of, well, what do you define as the best we have, right? Because now we've got this technique that is sort of the best cryobiology technique in the world, okay? Um, but it doesn't have evidence that it that it really preserves synapses, right? And you've got another technique that absolutely will kill every cell irreversibly, right? But if you look at it with an electron microscope, it looks really pretty, right? You know, what do you use depends on how you're viewing the problem. I think I'm less worried about you, Inyash, or about this than you are, Inyash. Uh, I don't plan on dying this month, so I'm hoping <laughs> that, you know, in hopefully several decades, they will be refined to the best available practices that are, you know, out there. And it won't well, I mean, when you talk about me. they, it's it's literally just me that's working on this right now. So yeah. uh, I do wish that there was more than, than just literally one guy doing it. Um, but hopefully, hopefully in 40 years, it won't be just you. Well, I mean, that's, when you say hopefully in 40 years, I, I was much more optimistic about those sorts of things when I was in my 20s. I'm like, yeah, people are working on it. And now that I'm like 
in the later half of my 30s already, I'm like, oh my god, two decades have gone by since I first started becoming aware of this thing, and it's been two decades without much progress. Like, I, I'm actually now to the point where just saying I hope people work on it isn't enough. If several more decades could pass. I don't plan on dying in the... I don't think I'll be dying in the next few decades, but I want to have been made a little more progress than was made in the last few decades, you know? Well, I mean, look, when, when cryobiology was first, you know, coming onto the, into the forefront, people sincerely believed um, in the 60s that we would have reversible suspended animation in five years. Yeah. And, I mean, really respectful people believe this, similar to how, you know, like Minsky literally at the Dartmouth conference assigned the entire problem of computer vision to, like, two grad students as a three-month project, Okay. You know, just just make computers be able to see. Like, how hard could it be? Yeah. And it turned out that that these things were way harder than anybody could have imagined. And so, you know, this we're gonna get it pretty soon. Sometimes that doesn't happen, right? And and I was really motivated to try and, and make it happen because, you know, I think we got a good shot of, of doing it now. We know so much more about brains and memories. And we got all these cool chemical techniques, and there hasn't been too much effort towards, you know, approaching it from an information perspective. That there's a lot of low hanging fruit, and it's uh, it's a good thing to be doing. Yeah. So, how do you how do you get funding for this right now? Because I can't imagine that it, you know, pays for itself. Well, we have funding from the National Institute of Mental Health, and we work with the Synthetic Neurobiology Group at MIT, uh, Ed Boyden. and we're working on connectomics technologies, right? So this 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 thing that I made is the most advanced brain banking technique in the world. And if you want to use it to um, really study brains at, especially human brains at the nanoscale level, there's nothing else that can, can really do that and, and preserve samples for a really long time. So one project that, that I'm literally am working on right now, like and mixing chemicals for it as we're talking, uh, is this idea of taking a brain that's been preserved with aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation and being able to do useful things with it, such as preparing it for electron microscopy. <laughs> so right now I'm banging my head against this uh, this problem of, of staining and plastic embedding for electron microscopy that, that Nicola has, you know, been struggling with for years. And uh, it turns out it's a really hard problem. It's kind of kicking my ass right now. But today, hopefully, we'll finally get something that, that's, that works really well. So how terrified do I have to be that your funding is going to dry up and you're going to have to, like, go get a job doing accounting or whatever. <laughs> well, you know, I want you to I've, keep working on this for a long time is the thing. I basically committed my life to making this work. Um, so, you know, I'm going to figure out a way to make it work no matter what. Um, we've got, we have some private funding as well, um, which we'll get too far into, but it's a little, it's a little precarious now, I guess. Um, I do think that we're right on the cusp of people, you know, really seriously reconsidering this whole idea of preservation um, and pouring some more resources into it. And, and part of my job is to explain that well and, and get people excited about it. I, so, I, you know, I think you're doing a terrific job of that. I'm, I'm optimistic about about the future. Um, you know, I got a. It's kind of my responsibility to keep Nectome alive and funded and and be able to do some of this good research. Um, one of the really exciting projects that. That I'm very interested in is preserving the first human brain um, with aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation um, in a research context. Uh, you know, so this is like if someone who brought, donates their body to science, and then uh, basically slicing that brain and having it independently evaluated, um, and actually, you know, working out what the real time course is for brain degradation after death. Um, human neurons are tougher than a lot of other neurons, like animal uh, neurons, like rabbit, mouse, etc. And nobody really knows when the connectome degrades in a human model. Um, that research just hasn't been done. At least I've never been able to find it, and I have looked pretty extensively. And so, you know, figuring that out something useful so that we could say, you know, two hours after death, the connectome's still there. Five hours after death, it's not there, that type of thing. Um, I suspect that number's two hours, but I don't really know. Um, and so, you know, getting some of that research done uh, in a research context, I think, is, is key, right? Because then you're going to be able to say, here are the parameters by which we can guarantee that we can preserve your connect up, right? Is there anywhere that, like, I personally and maybe any other listeners that are, are moved to can donate to help fund this sort of thing? You mean donate money? Yeah. Um, you know, right now, I, th I think it makes more sense to do it from a, you know, for-profit perspective as a company. At least I want to I wanna try that out. Okay. And so, you know, we focus more on getting grants. Um, but, I mean, if anybody's interested in talking about it more, um, I'd be more than happy to talk to them. They can, they can email me at, at r at nectome. 
R at Roberto? Uh, yeah, R for Robert. And uh, be more than happy to talk to anybody who's, who's curious about it or wants to learn more about it or, you know, all that good stuff. And Nectome is N-E-C-T-O-M-E dot com. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, excellent. This crap. Well, we, we've been going about an hour. Um, did you want to... Do, uh, do I'm assuming you have important things you need to get back to? Yeah, I need to go... Uh... I need to go prepare my osmium tetroxide stain now, and and try not to kill myself doing it. And uh, got some got some meetings uh, later on in the day, so I am going to have to run. Uh, but it's been a real pleasure talking with you two. It has been fantastic. Uh, I I there were so many more things I wish we could have gotten to, but maybe some other day. Yeah, well, you know, if you want to get into the details of of electrohydrospy or really anything, uh, more than happy to, to do another one. I assume you edit these things and don't just post them raw, right? Yes. <laughs> So, you know, if you want to do another another hour, like, next weekend, and then have two to put together, we could do that. Especially if you wanted to prepare, you know, some questions or something. And, uh, you know, sorry for being a bit hectic today. But whatever you want to do. Uh, possibly. I will have to check with Stephen and check our calendars. But uh, next week or maybe the week after, uh, that sounds really good. Yeah, cool. Okay. Sounds fantastic. Thank you so much for Wonderful. joining us. And when you have a moment, uh, go ahead and drop me an email and we'll figure out another time. Well, before I let you go, Robert, I gotta thank you again. Um, this was one of the most riveting conversations I think that I've had on the podcast, and I think one of the most important. I uh, I guess I'm trying to think of multiple ways to express gratitude, but thanks again. This was fantastic, and uh, you know, please keep doing what you're doing. A lot of us are counting on you. <laughs> and uh, while we were talking, I I finally got that thing done. You saw it was a bunch of powder earlier. Now it's finally a nice golden solution. So oh, fantastic. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Cool. All right. Great, Robert. Thanks again. Have a good weekend. See you around. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. We can just dive in and say, you know, and for listener feedback, we can do it in the standard order and then just cut and paste it at the end if you want. Okay. All right. All righty. Today, we would like to thank Alexis Goldusky for helping support us. Uh, You make this possible and help bring it to everyone else. Thank you very much, Alexis. And because we don't have Kyle Moore this week to do uh, sound effects for us, we're just going to go dun-dun! Dun-dun! Thanks, Alexis. Yeah, you're awesome. And moving on to listener feedback. Eddie left a comment on the website on the social media and outrage culture episode. And I think that was one where you and I talked about engaging in arguments with really uh, savvy, wrong people. Like that climate science denier guy. So Eddie said, regarding the need to be more informed to win arguments, I think that street epistemology is a perfect tool for engaging with people who may know more about a topic than you do. Even if the topic at hand is well above your level, asking questions like, why do you believe this is true, is a good way to encourage the interlocutor to examine their own position as an outsider. By the way, they've gotten into the SD crowd on Facebook, etc. since our episode on it, so thanks. Cool. Bye, awesome. Eddie. I hope it's working for you. Yeah. I actually just had something similar happen yesterday where I was talking to my mom about uh, how you probably, I heard, shouldn't take vitamin D late at night. Better to take it in the morning. Uh, because your body usually gets most of its vitamin D from the sun, and so m- possibly might uh, disrupt sleep a little bit if you take it late at night. Hmm. And I was like, nah, I don't say, don't believe it all. That sounds like bullshit. This is a load of crap. I don't know why you're telling me that. It's like, okay, I mean, that's interesting, but why do you believe that? And I was like, uh, I just do. <laughs> it was interesting to see the change on her face when I, I didn't challenge her belief. I just asked her why she believed it, you know? And that made her actually stop and consider. And we talked about it for a little longer after that. Yeah, and it's not a question I think most people ask themselves when they think they know things. Regarding, I guess, that thing in particular, I just take a daily multivitamin in the morning. Because I think for the most part, if you eat anything like a balanced diet, you don't need vitamins because mm-hmm. you're getting enough of everything. But since I don't, mm-hmm. <laughs> it helps. And then um, there's always the controversy as to how much your body can really absorb from a multivitamin. Right. Yeah. I don't take ones that have like 5,000%. It's the $4 for 100 that you get at Target or whatever. I figure for a few cents a day, it's not a big deal. Exactly. I can spare a few cents a day. There's there's more things to be worried about than whether people are you know, wasting a few cents a day. Although you can take too many vitamins and hypervitamin toxicity is a real thing. Yeah. Or is it hypervitaminosis? I forget which. Turns out that vitamin K is a treatment for hypervitamin toxicity. Okay. I don't know what you do if you overdose on vitamin K. Mm. <laughs> uh, we'll ask a, a scientist. <laughs> anyway, regarding this, so that I think that the... The fundamental questions, what do you think you know, how do you think you know it, that sort of thing. And a straight Socratic method, you know, what do you mean, I guess, asking naive, clarifying questions. I think that would work great on the casual conversation with, like, you know, our moms about over-the-counter meds they're taking or people we bump into at work about whatever, right? Yeah. But with a sophisticated arguer like that climate science denying guy, I'm not convinced that would work. It might be worth trying for fun, but I feel like they would have answers to that. 
They, I mean, I'm sure that Grover Norquist would have, and I know Ken Ham does too, for all the questions that you can ask him about creationism. Yeah, I get the inf- but, uh, feeling that, what was his name, Horquist? Nor- uh, Grover Norquist. Norquist would be much more capable of like an actual dialogue. Ham would just say like, well, you know, we have that answer, it's in this book. No, no, um, no, like Ken Ham knows all the answers. He goes and debates. I just, I saw part of his debate with, with Bill Nye, and that's what he kept saying. Oh, so really? Bill Nye would ask, like, you know, well, what about this? And he's like, well, we actually know that. It's in this book. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's the Bible. Oh, um, my God. So, yeah. Oh, I mean, debate. so I could, like, he's clearly not playing the same maybe, game, right? Maybe it wasn't Ham. Maybe it was, um, I know there's some people that, that are creationists that are much more researched on that and have answers. Like, well, you know, if, if you do this and this with the biology, then that happens oh sure like yeah so you can get i I, so i don't think i give ken ham the sophisticated arguer status like uh dinesh d'souza or um francis collins might be right where you would talk to them and they would talk about things like macro evolution versus micro evolution that sort of thing but if you're coming in from you know where socrates claims to come from and like i really don't know anything i feel like you wouldn't know if you heard a really good bullshit answer whether or not it was bullshit and i mean you can ask all the gives you it gives you a tool to dig with to, yeah, for sure. But they might have this bedrock that, while wrong, is solid enough that you can't dig it anymore, right? Yeah, but um, but it's better than just trying to... It's probably better than trying to challenge them on things that you have a like weak understanding of. So I guess maybe this would be worth trying at some point. I wonder if we can grab somebody that we disagree with at some point and bring them on for something fun. And that knows a lot more than us about a topic. That shouldn't be hard to find. No, it shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you went to school for more than a month? You probably know more than us. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, Eddie. I like that uh, that feedback, and that's something to consider. Hell yeah. I have some feedback. This was uh, on the subreddit. We were referred by Ceremonial Carl Popper to a post by Sam Zadat. Or Sam Zedat, maybe? I'm not sure. This is the website where we talked about the seeing like a state. I got about half of my material from that website, so I I got some respect for it. I'm going to greatly cut down the what is said in the post just to get to the real meat because the guy is very loquacious. What's the term for when you use more words than you necessarily need to? One word for it is long-winded. Another way to put it is thorough. Okay, (laughs) yes. Very thorough. I'll give him that. And by the way, have you read any of this guy? Have you read any of The Last Psychiatrist? No. I swear to God, I have this conspiracy theory that after The Last Psychiatrist retired from blogging, like a year or two later, he was like, I want to start again, but I don't want to start as The Last Psychiatrist. So now he's posting on Sam Zedat instead, because it sounds absolutely like The Last Psychiatrist. How do you spell Sam Zedat? S-A-M-Z-D-A-T. Oh, that's not... Okay, just like it sounds. Yeah. I don't remember the name of the actual poster of this, which is terrible. I, I... hate it when people <laughs> uh, have a name in their blog title, but it's not the name of the person. But anyways, this is a for our uh, social media episode. First of all, the article points out that Tristan Harris is selling an app. So he has sort of a vested interest in making you feel like you are addicted to social media. The, I believe the app is called Time Well Spent or something. It's a way to reduce how much time you're spending on social media. Oh, sure. And so he's like right away, aha, monetary motive. But he makes some very interesting points. He says, Facebook records 2 billion monthly users. If they pay $5 a month, then they won't need to addict you. Because the whole point of addicting someone is to get revenue through advertising. If you get revenue from this $5 a month, they don't need to addict you, right? Uh, He goes on to say, avoiding the attention apocalypse is cheaper than a pack of cigarettes, I guess. Apparently, none of that is so addictive for them to risk charging 1 30th of a smoker's budget. If social media isn't worth $5 a month to you, then what does that say about how you value your time? And if the response is, all my friends are on it and they write interesting things, then how little do you value your friends' time? Hmm. Goes on to say, The classic critique of media is that it tells you what you want to hear. Media tells you what you want to hear, but sharing it tells others what you want them to think about you. So sharing an article tells your friends that you're the kind of guy who shares this important article. So anyone interested in the addiction article either has a problem or wants to gloat, but focusing on the problem people, they need to understand why they keep doing a thing, being on social media, that does not satisfy them. Further, they need it explained in such a way that they are not to blame. This is precisely what Tristan Harris, what Tristan Harris offers. An explanation for why you have no power and why some other has it. The problem with advertising and media and Tristan Harris's is not that they fail to provide you what you want, is that they give you exactly what you want all of the time and you just wanted the wrong thing. 
which is why I say that he sounds very much like the last psychiatrist. They very much have a vibe of stop being a shitty person and stop being narcissistic and really look at yourself and fix yourself in a in a really non sugar coated way. And and I liked that article and I just wanted to share that a little bit too. So can you paraphrase? Was he pro Tristan Harris or anti Tristan Harris? He's anti everything. <laughs> He's kind of anti humans, but somewhat anti Tristan Harris, anti social media, anti people who use social media, anti people who complain about using social media too much. That sort of thing. Okay, so there's nothing he's pro then, because it, like it sounds like he's pro. Uh, like he and he and Tristan Harris agree that we're using social media too much. Yes, but he's yet... pro growing up and being a goddamn adult and recognizing that the reason you use uh, they're both very big on narcissism. The reason you use social media is a narcissistic impulse to present an image of who you are to other people. Sure. And I mean, that's really what social media is for, right? Here's the pictures of me when I'm having the most fun and looking the best. Here's the articles that paint me in a good light because this is what I'm uh, worried about. This is what I think is important. And so uh, he's saying that that is a narcissistic thing and it is damaging to people and probably to society in general when there's a lot of people like that that are more concerned with the uh, style and the image they're presenting than the actual substance of their character. Yeah, you won't find any disagreement with me on that as far as how people... Like, that's why people share what they share on Facebook, right? Well, about half of them, probably. The other half just, like, cute doggo pictures. Well, sure. But they're the kind of people who want people to know that they share dog pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's just... you're sharing dog pictures, you just like the cute dog. <laughs> it's signaling all the way down. <laughs> right. um, yeah, so uh, Tristan has this app, and I'm looking at it right now. It doesn't seem to me like any more uh, less good than, like, those... Uh, like an ad block app or what are those ones? I forget what it's called, but cause I've never used them, but you can set up apps that you can blacklist certain websites and say, okay, once I have this extension eng engaged on Chrome, it won't let me look at Facebook or any of those apps for, uh, you know, three hours or something. Cause I want to actually work. Yeah. Productivity uh, apps. Yeah. So I, I guess I don't see why did he bring up Tristan Harris's app? Because Tristan Harris was really big and all over the media recently. Yeah. But like, he, so he has a motive to share this, but yeah, like he saw a problem and is trying to fix it. And if he can make money while doing it, that's just a win for him too. Right. Right. But I don't think that I didn't get the impression anyway, that he, you know, kind of made up the problem and then provided the solution for no. it. Right. So like, that's like what a snake oil salesman does. Right. This doesn't seem like snake oil. It sounds like he's actually trying to sell a solution to an actual problem. Yes. I, I think Tristan Harris is doing good work by sounding this alarm, which I guess we, a lot of people are already aware of it, but it takes someone oftentimes to stand up and say, hey, this is actually a problem before people are willing to acknowledge it. And also kind of providing a thing that can help. The The Last Psychiatrist and those sorts of blogs, I'd really like to be very cynical about everything. Right on, I can dig it's it. part of the brand. Not Without Incident on the subreddit says, uh, again, about social media, I think that dispassionate cynicism or disengaging is probably more dangerous to humanity than unwarranted outrage. And I don't know. What do you think about that? Because I'm kind of of the opinion that unwarranted outrage is probably worse, partly because that gets you things like lynch mobs, and also because it gets you... Uh, recently, Eliezer started posting another sequence of posts slash a new book, and uh, he mentioned that there is a nutrient solution that some premature infants are given to treat a condition uh, they're, that they're born with, which is lacking a very important nutrient. Uh, it's one of the omegas. The point is, this nutrient solution is basically poisoning and killing babies at a rate of maybe 100 a year or so. And it's super easy to fix. All you got to do is swap out the soybean oil with fish oil. It's, it's cheap. It's easy. There's a decent amount of people that know this, and yet we as a society cannot get it done. You just, due to FDA regulations and other things, you cannot get that nutrient solution for your baby that will not poison it if it has this problem. And he mentioned that one of the things is, if you bring this up, like to try to get attention to the issue and fix the issue, there's not enough outrage left in society to, to be outraged about 100 dead babies a year. We're too busy being outraged about, you know, what some celebrity said or who is being a douchebag on Twitter recently. And so that is sapping all of the outrage that could be used for actual productive things like saving babies' lives to just fighting the culture wars. I think I agree on both counts. I'm cer certainly my, my intuition was the same as yours, that like if you're just cynical, all you're going to do is just like sit at home and think about how dumb everyone is. But if you're outraged over nothing, you're inclined to get online and ruin someone's life or help ruin someone's life or yell at people in real life or something, right? Um... You know, warranted outrage is totally, I think, a thing that, you know, as long as your your outrage is productive, I'm, I can get behind and understand, right? 
Oh, first of all, yeah, the outrage fatigue, though. Yeah, if you're getting fatigued, if you have something productive to do at home, you know, that re re requires physical labor, but you burn all your energy working out, then you can't actually get the work done. Mm -hmm. And the working out doesn't actually do anything for anybody. Then you're wasting all that energy, right? And the analogy falls apart because you get healthier, but whatever. Right. This, you just get sicker. Yes. <laughs> but there was a woman who, she had like 150 Twitter followers and tweeted some shitty joke before traveling to, uh, to Africa. Oh God, I Did remember you hear about, about this? this. Yes. Yeah. So... She said, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. And then her second tweet was, just kidding, I'm white. Yeah. I mean, whether or not it's a funny joke, like, I feel like a comedian, like Sarah Silverman could have got away with it, right? Uh -huh. but... It's one of those intentionally offensive jokes that is in bad taste. Yeah. It might and... be funny if you're in the mood. And, you know, it's even, it's funnier too if it came from somebody with a reputation as a comedian. Right. But, so what ended up happening, the, the quick version is that she uh, tweeted this out, you know, again, 150 followers. She's not sitting there on top of a mountain of a million followers. I don't know what's a big number. That's probably a lot. While she was in the air for 10 hours, she like hit number one or two on trending on Twitter and she was just ripped apart. And then when she landed, she's like, oh, everyone hates me. I've got a million death threats and I've lost my job. Yeah. Um, so like, I feel like people get online to rip her apart bad joke or not even if she meant it or rather even if she this was coming from a malicious place which i'm not convinced it was i didn't read the full dissection of what happened here but mm -hmm. and unless she's working in public relations that probably doesn't have much of an impact on her job to be making shitty jokes yeah to be making shitty jokes it is interesting though and i do have mixed feelings about like do you want somebody who believes bad things to be working for you right on the one hand like their beliefs don't really you know if you were a neo-nazi you could still do your accounting job just fine I could, but if my black or Jewish coworkers knew that I was a neo-Nazi, that would make working with me very difficult in the office, probably. Sure. And since you have to work with other people, that can be an issue. Well, like I said, I feel like even Louis C.K. or another comedian could have gotten away with this, right? Mm -hmm. It's also just weird because nobody had ever heard of her because she had 150 Twitter, Twitter followers, and this just exploded and set her life on fire. So yeah. um, because people at home were like, I'm outraged at this. And I think that brings up something that we need to talk about at more length at some point that I don't really understand that response. And I don't really get being offended on behalf of other people. Mm. Um, like, who's like, is that joke offensive to me? Maybe. But it's probably definitely offensive to somebody. But should I be offended for them? And if I am, do they have to stop? Right. I don't really get offense. But that's a whole other thing. We should definitely do an episode on offense. Deal. I will say, though, that on the other hand, Lots of dispassionate cynicism gets you to Quirrell, Voldemort Quirrell, from Methods of Rationality. I mean, that was basically his shtick. He is the dispassionate cynic. And that's when you can sit back and watch atrocities happen and be like, yeah, well, you know, humans gonna be humans. First race war, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, summer. First race war, huh? <laughs> yeah. um. So that's, that's also a problem. And dispassionate cynicism could just as easily get you the same thing as like, eh, so 100 babies a year die, whatever. I don't have time to switch out my oils. That's true. And that race war thing was a Rick and Morty reference, so we're not really laughing at race wars. <laughs> um, lest... Aren't we, though? <laughs> <laughs> Pointy nipples versus what? Uh, spiral, spiral nipples, nipples yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, think, I guess that's true. Maybe, I mean, the key, you know, I think with a lot of answers with a lot of things like this that involve extremism is go for that golden mean aristotelian virtue and say look moderate your outrage moderate your your cynicism leave some energy to be productive because yeah if you're overly cynical then you learn that oh yeah this person did all these terrible things uh you know kevin spacey last week had all those confirmed or those i guess confirmed he more or less said i probably did that to some of these allegations i think it makes sense to have some level of of outrage about that and there's, you know, a response that sounds appropriate. Um, but then you can go over the top and whatever. Some people, someone probably tweeted, I want him dead. Or it'd be great if he died. And I don't, I almost never feel that way about anybody. But that's a whole other thing. I think it kind of goes back to all debates are bravery debates, which is a Scott Alexander post saying that basically a lot of reaction that people have is what they see their community going too far in one direction and they're trying to pull it back. And people in a different community who is going too far in the other direction are like, are you fucking crazy? You want even more of this? And so I imagine using that as a model that Not Without Incident is probably in a place where there is a lot of dispassionate cynicism that's hurting him. Whereas we're in a place where there's a lot of unwarranted outrage that's hurting us. We're both right, just in different places. Yeah, that makes sense. Nice compromise. And I, I, I think I stand by the fact that moderation is probably the key there. Hmm. First of all, what was the Yudkowsky posts? Where are those at? Uh, those are at lesserwrong.com. And by the way, for anyone who is 
uh, or if you used to be on lesswrong.com and doesn't know about this yet, there is an effort to, an actual, like, real legit effort that seems to be gaining some serious traction here to revive uh, the Less Wrong community over at lesserwrong.com. Oh, it's at lesserwrong.com. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And they've got posts up by uh, this V, who I really like, and Elias Ryadkowski, and a whole bunch of other big rationalist names, which... Let's see. We have an email here from uh, Satir. That's how they signed it. Their last uh, paragraph here was asking about um, starting a rationality discussion society in their local area. What sort of essential skills and knowledge we would recommend? I don't know if I'm the best person to ask about that. Like, we started the one here, but that was kind of just like, we had the catalyst from the Methods of Rationality wrap-up party. Yeah. And I just wanted to keep that going. I and, totally uh, want to have a whole episode about that and include Max Harms on it. Yes. So that is that is forthcoming. That's on the list. I wanted to let you know. Cool. And there's another thing on here that we might be able to hit pretty quickly. Um, I think it'd be interesting if you did an episode at some point where you showed how one implemented Bayesian skills. For instance, I've yet to explicitly apply Bayes, praise be his name, mm -hmm. uh, law, uh, they clarify that was tongue in cheek. Um, yes. <laughs> so we're one of those communities that's like, by the way, I'm just joking about this crazy <laughs> thing for myself. I can answer that pretty quickly in that I've, I've so far never put pen to paper and calculated my, my priors versus the impact of the expected evidence and that sort of thing. But the main thing that I do to adjust my thinking is that I realized that my beliefs about the world are not the actual facts of the world. Yeah. Um, the map versus territory distinction. Yeah. And like, so that sounds super obvious and it kind of is in retrospect, but it's not a distinction. At least I made on my own 10 years ago. Cause what you believe about the world feels just like how the world is. Right. And your beliefs don't have to be, I believe this, or I don't believe this. You can say, I believe this with 85% confidence or whatever, you don't even have to assign an 85 versus 86%, but you can mm -hmm. say, I'm pretty confident. And those confidence levels, I think, keep you epistemologically humble mm -hmm. in that if someone comes to you with evidence against whatever belief you have, you're not going to say, well, that has to be wrong because I have this belief and it's right. You could say, oh, I didn't expect to see things like that because I was pretty sure this was right. Can I bring up my parents again, just because lately I've been trying to sneak some rationality into their intellectual diet? Go nuts. Okay, so I was talking with my dad. He, he made this comment about uh, my sister was joking around with my mom and said that my mom needs to be on anti-anxiety medicine. And my dad said, no, no, she was my, the sister was saying that she needs to be on anti-anxiety medicine, not my mom. And my mom was like, no, she totally said, I need to be on it. And my dad was like, hmm, you might have a point, but I'm going to go with 99.99% <laughs> certainty that she was saying it about you and not about herself. And so my mom called her up and uh, verified that she was talking, in fact, about my mom, not about herself. And my dad was like, huh, okay, well, you know, I said I wasn't 100% sure. And at this point, I was like, okay, dad, I, I didn't say this at the time when you made your confidence uh, de declaration. But for, for you to say that you have 99.99% confidence in something is extremely uh, much stronger than you think. For example, me and my friends, every now and then, as part of our rationalist thing, try to make some predictions about the future, and we make a number of them, and if we predict that, like, 10 things will happen with 70% confidence, we want to be right for 7 of them and wrong for 3 of them, because that means we are accurately calibrated. Uh, if we were, like, right about 9 of them and only wrong on 1, we would feel ashamed, because we were too unconfident we should have been 90 percent confident in those predictions or at least we would feel wrong because I, I don't know if we want to encourage shame there but i, we, I was we, trying to shame him a little uh, bit yeah. for saying 99.99 sure, sure. i agree yeah. two, two significant figure significant digits into it like one in a thousand chance of being wrong and something that minor that's yeah. one in ten thousand oh. I, I told him that if you had been us you would have had to make ten thousand statements of equal confidence and only gotten one of them wrong and do you really think that was a statement that strong? Because first of all, you know that just as a human, sometimes you hear things wrong. And that was a pretty easy one to hear wrong. So that by itself should have dropped you down to like maybe 90. And also, you know your daughter. I know my daughter. She's kind of a person who would make a mean joke about my mom needing anxiety medicine, but never ever saying that about herself. So that should have updated you even more. Like I would have said, even if I had heard with my own ears her saying that she needs medicine. Once I heard someone saying, no, 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 she was saying it about your mom, I would have been like, okay, yeah, I I'm dropping down to 70% confidence, even though I heard with that with my own ears, just from what else I know. And so I, I think I think I managed to get through a little bit to him that confidence is, is more important than just saying, well, you know, I'm almost positive. Take those things that you know into consideration, what you know about a person and what you know about how likely it is to mishear something. 
Yeah, throw in the fallibility of memory there, and I'd be like, you know what, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's you know it, it's it's those kinds of things where you you help people think about their beliefs in a probabilistic manner rather than just right or wrong. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, if you want to make a Bayesian calculator and do the math, you're welcome to. But that's sort of to me just like an exercise in. I wouldn't. Just, I don't want to say it's pointless. The the key is like not to say okay. I guess it, I should be eighty six percent confident, not eighty four. Because mm -hmm. what are you supposed to do with that information, knows. right? Yeah. But the idea is to to get some ability to calibrate your confidences. And like I said, for me, it's just keeping your beliefs about your beliefs non binary, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's my quick take on that. I think that's that is a very good basic rationality skill that doesn't take too terribly long to teach, and really gets you on the road. Cool. Yeah, that's where I'm at too. Okay. I have a post on the subreddit by RTLPU saying, I've heard the sentiment that children are boring a few times in the rationalist sphere and on this podcast. I beg to differ. Being around a child is watching a sentient being learn in real time. Highly interesting, to me at least. Do we say kids are boring? We I probably we said doing have. things with kids is boring. That's possible too. I definitely, I know I've said that because yeah. <laughs> I think I might have been quoting a Louis C.K. bit where he's talking about watching them read Clifford the Big Red Dog at the rate of 30 minutes a page. Yeah. And you have to sit there being super bored and super proud because it's awesome watching them read and it's got to be satisfying. But at the same time, it's like the story's boring. You're reading it in a really boring way. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I will say I was, I was the oldest of my siblings and I taught them things often. And if it hadn't required a college degree, I totally would have gone into teaching because I really love teaching. And I am still around young kids every now and then. And so I totally agree. Watching people learn in real time is fucking fascinating, especially when it's like a little kid and they first grasp for the first time, like that big things far away look smaller, but that doesn't make them smaller. You know, it's just, it's really neat. But on the other hand, the majority of the time that you're around kids, you got to do things that are really fucking boring. So I guess it's it's more of a, if the kids are your own, you probably spend a lot of time doing boring life, keeping kids alive maintenance chores, as opposed to the cool learning bits. But you're, I think you're definitely right. There are some really cool parts about seeing a new being learning things. Yeah, teaching is a lot of fun. And it's gratifying, you know, to understand it well yourself. What age, what age level were you, would you have considered teaching at? Oh, I'm like as a job after I got out of high school. Oh, I'm sorry. What age would you want people to, would you, your students to be? Oh, so I could do like mm, the early grades between second and fourth, maybe, or I could do high school because in high school, then you get to start teaching them really cool shit. Right. right. But I do not want to teach middle schoolers because that was, I, I really should not say bad things about an entire class of people, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you, that was you refer a terrible to yourself place. As a, middle, yes, as a middle schooler. That sure. was a terrible place in my life, and I have very negative connotations of middle schoolers, especially middle school age boys, so I would not want to be within a mile of them, especially not in large concentrations. I've... Just I, personally. No, for sure. I completely agree. So I thought about teaching for a while. I have a couple family or a couple family members who are teachers. Oh, cool. And... So, I mean, first of all, if you want to make half of what you make now, teaching is not that hard to get into. I don't think you don't really need a, a full college degree to, t I mean, depending on what level you want to teach and all that, you just need a teaching certificate. Yeah, with various charter schools and such, they, they're or not. Or public schools. Public schools now, too? You don't need a, I mean, maybe a bachelor's, but um, they, so often but, not, I think. I mean, a bachelor's is four years of my life and like no, 80000 sure. in debt. For sure. But I think... And I can double check this, but when I was talking to my aunt about it at one point, she had said that it's not that bad to get into. And certainly I think if you wanted to teach second to, or yeah, second to fourth graders, they don't need you to have a, you know, a degree in whatever you're talking about because they're guaranteed to know more than them anyway. <laughs> um, when I thought about teaching... But you got to know how to teach. Like teaching itself is also a skill. Sure. You can buy a book. It'll be fine. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I couldn't teach kids. I think I would be frustrated trying to cross that inferential distance between... Just there's so much to get across to get them to have any idea of what you're talking about. And then you're just teaching them like times tables and all that stuff. And um, I taught someone skiing once and it took me half the day on the slopes just to learn how to teach them. Like you just do the skiing, right? And you don't think about it. And it's so like having to think about what you're doing and how to explain what you're doing and get them to figure out how to do what you're trying to say. It's yeah, it was it was a full day project because half the time was just me figuring out how to say it. Yeah. And like 
noticing what you're doing to make yourself not fall or go faster or whatever, right? Yeah. So I, I believe teaching is a legit skill that takes time to learn. Oh, yeah, for sure. I was being tongue-in-cheek when I said you could <laughs> grab a book on teaching and master it in five seconds. I understood uh, it was a joke. Okay. Yeah, yeah to, be, to be clear, it, it is a challenging thing that I certainly don't have the aptitude to do at that level. Like I've done, I when I was at college or when I was in uh, at CSU, I was the teaching assistant for one of the classes. I TA'd, but um, I wasn't a teacher aide. I was a teaching aide. It's a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I think I was both. Um, and it's gratifying. You know, you can explain stuff to somebody, and then you know when their eyes light up and understanding, that's super gratifying. But you know, those were young adults. It's a lot easier, I think, for me in my personality style. I had a philosophy professor once who. Well, at least he expressed to me in whatever capacity he could without losing his, without jeopardizing his job, that teaching sucked and like the environment surrounding his teaching sucks. And obviously not everyone feels that way, but he felt he, like he did more time, more effort arguing to with the board and the administrators to try and teach stuff the way that he thought would work rather than just actually teaching. Yeah. And I'm also worried. I hear that like half your time or more is dealing with the one or two problem students in the classroom. And I don't want to do that. That oh, sounds like a drag. <laughs> So I have the additional problem that I couldn't teach adults like at a college level because I look like a junior high school student or maybe a high school student. So like I, I think I'd have a hard time commanding respect when they're all taller than me and have beards. Um, <laughs> so, but I thought like it would be fun to get around some of that culture friction to teach at a par at a private school. Um, a, you'd probably need a lot more credentials to do that. But B, you could get on board with how the private school does stuff and then they might give you more freedom to do whatever you want as long as they're learning stuff. And that sounds like more fun because... If you're just burning fuel trying to do your job, that's super discouraging and disheartening. Yeah. But yeah, teaching is fun. And I think learning or watching kids learn is probably a lot of fun. And I can't imagine what it's like to be a parent and watch your kid take its first steps and uh, form its first full sentence and that sort of thing. I'm sure it's awesome. Yeah. So this one is probably going to be a little bit of a discussion. On our website, thebayesianconspiracy.com, Senju says, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys appear to be unsure about what conservatism and liberals and all that means. Because we, we started talking about which party is more more in favor of freedom, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Senju says, I think this is a great point because I think there's also, that's also a result of your two-party system. Either you're in the red camp or you're in the blue camp. In Germany, we have the FDP, which basically stands for less government control in all areas. Less surveillance, less control in the economy, all that. And I think that's what liberals are about. And I think that is also what I meant when I said that I, uh, liberals were the ones that are trying to scale back government. Because when I think of liberals, I think of more like the libertarian, like the classic definition of liberal being don't control other people. But then you brought up that the blue party in, in our system tends to be the one that tries to regulate heavily a lot of businesses and get involved in a number of things that are really a lot of government control. But on the other hand, the red party is the one that wants to come into your bedroom and tell you what drugs you can't do, who you can't sleep with, what religion you should be. And they are slightly less regulatory, but really just regulatory in a different way. I agree. I don't think that either party is non-regulation. And you don't want no regulation. I mean, I read John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, but it's, you know, five, what's a, I don't know, I'm holding my fingers like a centimeter apart. It's a really small book, but that's, I'm not up to date on like the best libertarian philosophy. I mean, there, there's a, there's a version of that that makes a lot of sense, but I don't know how you run a society that way. Mm -hmm. um, certainly not a good society. Uh, you need regulation at some point. So like you want uh, somebody to say, yeah, you can't be putting out that much waste you know, and you can't just dump it in the park. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, which, which party is going to say that's for too much regulation. You can't tell me where I can't put my radioactive waste. Hopefully both parties are on board with saying you can't put that shit in the park or anywhere, right? But you're right. One party is saying, no, look, here's the kind of sex we want you to have. And that we're, you know, we're going to make it a big deal or uh, you can't do this with your body if you want an abortion. Um, mm -hmm. what is, what's a good example of blue control? I don't really see registering guns as a, an infringement on control. Uh, in in our society, it is. In our society, it's viewed that way. Yeah, there's here is a physical object that you are not allowed to own. That, I don't think that, that wasn't what I was saying. I was saying registering it is right. different than saying you can't have one. Yes, it's just like you know, no one's no one's saying you can't buy a car, but we want to know which ones you have. Yeah, right? but that's that's government surveillance, right? That's yeah. the government knowing what you own, where you live. All but that, that's things. different than saying you can't do it. Just saying. Yeah, but it, surveillance, a lot of people have negative um, 
thoughts about that as well. I'm not a huge fan of surveillance either, but... I'm not that anti-surveillance in principle. Uh, in practice, it tends to be shitty, and so I am in practice. Someday, yeah. I, I, my, I, I'll have to talk about my radical transparency roots. I think we talked about that a bit with Chase. Did we? Yeah. Okay, and eventually I abandoned them. I think there's a difference between surveillance and control. One is saying, we're going to watch you do this stuff. The other one is saying, you can't do this stuff. Right. But watching you is the first step to control. They don't have to put cameras in our bedrooms to outlaw gay sex, right? <laughs> right. Um, assuming that they wanted to. Like, let's say if this was India. You is know, gay sex illegal in India? Uh, my impression is that it is. I read something like that just this morning. Okay. Um, if it's not, it's legal somewhere, right? Okay. So right. they don't have they don't have cameras in bedrooms. Like, they don't need to surveil you. They're just saying, you can't do this. And if someone says you did, we're going to kill you or jail you or whatever. The whole the government being able to know where you are at all times by tracking your phone data that we talked about recently is a sort of a government surveillance thing. Oh, absolutely. So what what was the point that we missed there that they drew contention with? I want to... Uh, that we were confused as to what is conservatism and what is liberalism. Yeah, and I guess the other thing is that libertarianism is further to the right on the spectrum if you're drawing a flat line than liberalism, right? Liberalism is the far left, conservatism is the far right, and libertarian is far or is right of center, uh, depending. Yeah. It's maybe it's one of those weird things that like every sci-fi movie does when they fold a piece of paper in half and punch a hole through it. Right. Um, maybe it hits both. Like, and it yeah. kind of does yeah but i think libertarian is it's weird in some way it's it's r more right in some things and more left in others yeah because like not regulating business is very conservative right yeah um but, but not, you know not, not caring what drugs you use is uh -huh. very liberal yeah so maybe i view it as more right of center maybe it's because people that i know that are libertarians are more inclined towards conservatism than, than I liberalism think, i think the reason it has such a very strong flavor of rightism in our society is because libertarians at some point got together and decided that since this is only a two-party system in america and libertarians literally can't run uh right now and get a, have a shot at winning any seats that they're going to vote republican more often than democrat because republican are more closely aligned to the more of the things they care strongly about hmm. so even though I don't consider them either right or left, since they tend to vote the same way the rightists vote. They have the the right flavor. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I got one last thing, which is pretty short. Uh, this is just as an, an informative thing. Googleplex Byte on the subreddit says, Regarding the valuation of intellectual property, my estimate for the value of the concept of a comedy film is certainly incredibly rough, but you could fairly easily make rights holders accurately value their property with the threat of auction. If a government evaluator feels that the right holder has undervalued their property, then the evaluator can demand an auction for the property where the rights holder's proposed value is their maximum bid, putting them at considerable risk, risk of losing the property at auction proportional to their undervaluation. Which is an interesting way to fix that. Google Plex Byte has obviously either thought or read a lot about this topic. Yeah, no, it's a good insight. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. That is really cool. I don't have enough knowledge there to challenge or confirm that, but I, I like where it's going. My freshman 101 objections were knocked down by your <laughs> having thought about this for more than five minutes. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, in that case, I think we're done with listener feedback and we can wrap it up. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again in two weeks. Sounds good. Bye. Bye.